stopping by. Really appreciate this guy coming back. The senator from the great state of Texas. It is Ted Cruz. Ted, how are you? Thanks, my friend. I'm doing great. How are you doing? I'm living the dream. Now, you're, you're home. What does Houston look like, man? I've got eight inches of snow out front. Power is spotty. No water probably for days. And I haven't showered, Ted. So what are we looking at here? Well, you know, Houston, we got uh, a lot of power out. We got power out all over the state. We've got two to three million Texans that are, that are lacking power. Houston, we have snow on the ground, not as much as we have in San Antonio or Austin or North Texas, but we've right. got maybe an inch or two on the ground uh, in Houston. Uh, thankfully, my home, uh, we didn't lose power, so right now we've got a bunch of the neighborhood kids all over playing with our girls because uh, their parents lost power and our house was lucky. So we've got kids running up up and down the stairs right now. Well, good. Hopefully everybody's going to enjoy it. Hopefully everybody will stay safe. I did have to hit the road earlier to go pick up my, my daughter and her kids. Uh, but uh, but hardly, hardly anybody's out there. And stay home if you can. Don't mess with it. But, Ted, i got to ask you what people want to know. Is this because Biden well, wanted and, to get and, back? And, and go ahead. Joe, go ahead. Joe, Joe, let me underscore that for yeah, everyone listening, please. which is which is that th- this storm is dangerous. It is. And there's a second storm expected to hit this week, which which will make things even worse. So if you can stay home, don't go out on the roads. Don't risk the ice. Um, I, I was speaking this weekend with a meteorologist expert who, who was saying the combination of these two storms, w- we could see up to 100 people uh, lose their lives this week in Texas. So don't risk it. Keep keep your your family safe and ju- just stay home and hug your kids. So far, people are being very smart uh, when it comes to this, and hopefully they'll continue to do that. Very, very fair warning. Uh, I want to talk, obviously, about what happened last week, the constitutionality of even trying somebody who is no longer the President of the United States. Ted, should we have taken away from John Roberts refusing to preside that he believed the Constitution said you're supposed to preside over a trial in the Senate for somebody who's still in office to see if he can stay in office? Well, I actually think the legal question of whether you, the Senate can try a former office holder is, is a close legal question. Right. That, that, that as a matter of constitutional law, uh, you can make good, real arguments based on the text of the Constitution both ways. Personally, I believe the better argument is, is that you can, that the Senate does have the jurisdiction to try a former office holder. But I also believe that the jurisdiction is not mandatory, which means we don't have to try it. Right. In this case, I don't think we should have because I think the case put forward by the House managers did not remotely meet, meet the legal standard for incitement, and, and, and I think we should have, should have declined it right at the outset. I want to make one last point on the constitutionality of it. Knowing full well, you're probably going to annihilate this point that I'm going to make. But let me make it anyway. Bill, uh, William Belknap was the guy who was brought up constantly, the former Secretary of War. This guy knew he was going to be impeached because there was some impropriety being alleged, and he resigned in the hopes of not getting impeached and not standing trial. I thought the precedent that was set in that case was you can't leave office on purpose prematurely to try to avoid this music that you had to face. Trump left office because his term ended. Isn't that different? Well, that's right, and, that, and that's an arguable distinction. I think the question is is very close, and, and, and for folks who are interested in, in a really detailed analysis of it, as you know, I do a podcast every week called Birds with Ted Cruz. It's we, great. We, we did an entire podcast doing a deep dive into each of the constitutional provisions at issue, and also the history, both the British common law history uh, that, that preceded the Constitution, and then the American history, both Belknap. Uh, and, and Senator Blunt are, are two examples that came up relatively early in our country's history. And so I walk through it and, and, and try to I- explain the legal issues, hopefully in a way that, that makes sense and is interesting and, and uh, useful. Uh, it's always interesting when you do these. I love the podcast. I think you, you and Michael do an incredible job. Let, let me let me ask you this. The reason why the constitutional question is so important to me and to those who are listening and watching right now is very simple because of what Mitch McConnell did. Mitch McConnell basically said, had I believed it was a constitutional impeachment trial, I might have thought about it more. And then he lit, he lit up former President Trump for a good 10, 15 minutes about what a horrible guy he is and how he did everything wrong. Mitch McConnell is trying to let himself off the hook uh, for the left and for moderates, I guess, um, by saying... It wasn't constitutional to do it. That's why he's not guilty. Otherwise, I would have looked at it deeper. Do you buy what he's saying? Well, I think that proved the basis for a number of the votes to acquit. And, and my view was always that, that, that the objective should be a not guilty verdict. I don't believe the president should have been convicted. And I, I made the case vigorously as to why that was the case. And, and, and I'm a big believer, as you know, before I was in the Senate, what I did for a living was argue cases at the U.S. Supreme Court. And, Very and well, if you're looking too. to get... Yeah. Thank you. Uh, you know, if you're looking to get to five votes at the U.S. Supreme Court, you don't particularly care what basis uh, people rely on to get there as long as you get get to five and, 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 and get the win. Likewise, uh, in order to get the acquittal, which we did, 
Uh, I think some of the Republicans who voted to acquit did so on, on the jurisdictional ground because they believed there wasn't jurisdiction. And, and I'm fine with that. That's a, that's a perfectly fine basis if, if they want to vote based on that. And I actually think the jurisdictional basis made it easier for, for some of the votes that, for lack of a better word, were wobblier. Some of the senators who were more nervous about saying uh, that they were confident on the merits, the jurisdiction let them say, okay, I can get there without having to address the merits. I, I think the merits are very straightforward, which is that uh, the House managers did not remotely present a case that this qualifies as incitement. Right. The language the president used, sometimes his rhetoric was overheated, uh, but it didn't meet the legal threshold for incitement. And, and the House managers, you know, they had 16 hours to present their argument. In those 16 hours, they devoted a total of about 15 minutes to talking about the legal standard for incitement. Right. And they couldn't lay out any coherent standard that wouldn't at the same time condemn repeated comments from Democrats uh, including the entire year we just had of violent riots all across the country where Democrats were celebrating, were apologizing for. Now, let me be clear. I don't think what the Democrats did constituted incitement either, but right. there's no way to say that what Trump said was incitement and what they said was not. And and that, that for me, is why I, I found this a very easy, not guilty vote. It's uh, Senator Ted Cruz, a great state of Texas, trying to stay warm in Houston where there's a bunch of snows, a bunch of snow where I am as well in uh, in the San Antonio area. Let me ask you about uh, being, like as a talk show host, I don't listen to a, other, a lot of other talk show hosts. Sean and I are friends, Glenn and I are friends, uh, but I don't listen to them very much because I feel that I could get jaded. But when I do listen, I find that uh, I'm, I'm able to tell a really good one and a not so good one. As an attorney, and I'm not an attorney, but as an attorney, as you were watching the House present the case, how did you take that stylistically compared to how uh, Trump's lawyers did the first day? As a novice, as a non-lawyer, I thought that the, the House presenters did a much better job in just doing the job. Their case sucked, and, and I hated that they were bringing it, but I thought that they were more effective compared to Trump's lawyer. How did you see that, and do you watch that as a lawyer? Yeah, I, look, n n no doubt, and I agree with what you said. I, I think the House managers are very talented trial lawyers. Jeremy Raskin, the lead manager, is a, a, a law professor and a serious constitutional law professor, yeah. and he did a very good job. They had trial lawyers, the House managers, that were good storytellers. And so they did a powerful, powerful story uh, that is exactly right that made the case that, that what happened on, on January 6th was a horrific terrorist attack on this country. I agree with that. Yeah. I, I lived through it. All 100 senators did. What they didn't do is, is demonstrate how the violent criminal conduct of the people who assaulted the, the Capitol demonstrates that President Trump was guilty of incitement. He explicitly urged them to be peaceful. By contrast, Kamala Harris, while riots were occurring across the country, while uh, stores were being looted, police cars were being firebombed, police officers were being murdered, Kamala Harris said these protests and attacks, they will keep coming and they should keep coming. And then she turned around and raised bail money right. for the violent criminals who had committed those attacks. Under any measure, her conduct was much more incitement than Trump's was. And, and the House managers, fundamentally, they couldn't answer that. And, and that's, I think, one of the reasons why uh, they failed and why the president was acquitted. Well, I think that their case was specious at best, but emotionally and, and just in the way that they acted it out, I thought they did a better job of presentation. And if you weren't paying attention to the substance, they did a better job. Thankfully, Michael Vanderveen at the end really closed the case very uh, just very tightly. He did exactly what you just pointed out. He showed Kamala Harris saying this. He showed the tweets. He showed all these Democrats saying we're going to fight like hell, which I never took as inciting a riot. I mean, that was really effective. That sort of shut the door, didn't it? Uh, it did, and you know, I'll tell you after after the first day, and I agree that the first day, uh, Trump's lawyers did not do as an effective job as they as they should have done. Yeah. Um, I went and I grabbed Lindsey Graham and Mike Lee, and the three of us went and sat down with with the Trump defense team, and 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 we spent I don't know forty five minutes an hour walking through where things were, right. and and the advice I shared with them. And by the way, you know, not uh, I didn't mean to be pitching the podcast, but I actually have an entire podcast where I laid out the advice I gave Trump's lawyer. I want you to pitch and, it. And uh, well, it's a verdict with Ted Cruz, and, and you can go listen to the inside story of what was happening and what the advice was that I gave Trump's lawyers and why. But it was exactly that, is to emphasize the hypocrisy. Go through all 100 senators that stood up on the stump and said, fight, fight, fight. That can't be incitement, because if it is, every person there is guilty of incitement. 
And, and that doesn't make any sense. Well, Ted, and, back, and of, so, back in the day, and you know this. And by the way, get his book, One Vote Away. It's an amazing book as well. It's, it's Senator Ted Cruz. Back in the day, the combatants on the campaign trail would say, don't vote for Bob Smith. He's got syphilis. And they were allowed to say that. You could say anything you wanted to because of the freedom and liberation that we have, the, the First Amendment, and political speech especially, has always been pretty raucous. Now we're, we're in a cancel culture sort of place where, where this guy Michael Vanderveen's house is being, is being um, uh, yeah. vandalized by people. You've got Gina uh, Carano can't say, hey, the cancel culture is not unlike pre- uh, World War II Nazi Germany, she loses her job. What do we do about cancel culture? I mean, this is a country that used to be the beacon of free speech. Now you can't say fight like hell without somebody saying you incited a riot? Really? It, 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 it is crazy. Now, what the Democrats would say if they were being candid is, of course you can say fight like hell if you're a Democrat. Yeah. That, that, that they are quite quite ready to, to acknowledge that they're embracing a, a, a double standard, that, right. that, that this only applies to Trump. And, and you know, look, I get that if you're a hardcore partisan, but that's not actually a fair standard to be, be following. It's uh, Senator Ted Cruz. We always appreciate the time and the access. Ted, one, one last thing, and I appreciate the time today. I know that it's, it's a rough day weather-wise in Texas, and you've been through it last week with that, with that very ridiculous uh, impeachment thing. People keep on asking me, will there be any ramifications or, or some sort of consequences for Eric Swalwell and, and the House managers presenting altered, clearly altered evidence? They altered a, a verified uh, uh, check mark on somebody. They, they used the word cavalry instead of calvary, which is what she wrote, which means biblical, you know, on the mountain, we're going to support you faithfully, yeah. not bringing in the horses and the soldiers, will there be any ramifications for them? They clearly either misunderstood what she said, or they were presenting false evidence. Well, I, I did think it was stunning that the House managers never responded uh, to those claims. Yeah. So the president's lawyers did a great job pointing out the dates, you know, a couple of the dates were 2020 instead of 2021, right. which demonstrated, certainly said on its face that those were, were falsified displays, and I, and I thought it was stunning that the House managers had no response to that. They just ignored it. I can tell you if you did that in a court of law and you, and you were demonstrated to have been guilty of, of falsifying evidence, you'd be looking at, at, at being held in contempt and, and sanctioned and potentially even disbarred. And so it was, uh, uh, I, I thought, striking that they didn't have a response to that. Uh, you know, as a practical matter, will there be consequences? Not in the House of Representatives. It's yeah, not like Nancy true. Pelosi's going to hold them to account. Yeah, they're running. Um, and, you know, so I think I think their view will be that, that – in politics, anything's okay, but that sure uh, that wouldn't be okay in any ordinary court of law. I know you're busy. I know, I know that taking the time today was not easy with the family all around and all the snow and the frigid weather. Thanks a lot for doing it, Ted. Let's talk again soon. Well, I appreciate it, Pags, and you did get a little bit of kids screaming in the background <laughs> and, and the dog barking, and it's the joys of being home with a hassle of kids, and, and there's some blessings to that. Absolutely. It's all good, my friend. We'll talk soon. We're back after this on the Joe Pag Show. Stay right here.